Thanks for joining me in Sheffy's Sandbox. I'm April Dawn Scheffler, and I invite you to play with me and my guest today, Stacy Kenny. Welcome, Stacy. Yay, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Well, in this first segment, we pop into a virtual coffee house before hitting the beach. And being the benevolent host that I am, your order's on me. So what order do you give the barista? <laughs> you know, like it's getting into fall season. I'm all about pumpkin spice. <laughs> maybe like a chai, maybe a chai. Well, now that you have your refreshing beverage, let's dive right in. Sometimes living one's purpose and going through this human experience can look like playing small, but other times it can look like playing big. So in your spotlight moment, Stacey, have there been any claims to fame, times our listeners may have seen you or your work? Um, you know, claims to fame. I released a book, an ebook, in early uh, COVID lockdown time. So uh, that could have, that you could have seen me there uh, and launched a podcast as well called Seeds of Love on Spotify. So maybe there too, just kind of like making my rounds in the creative world this like last year and a half to two years. Um, but outside of that, pretty, pretty quiet, you know, <laughs> pretty quiet. Well, guests are asked to choose a word or phrase that they would like to hear used more often in everyday conversations, something that doesn't get enough play or enough airtime. The prior guest chose like a super easy word, like you got to have easy with this one. <laughs> the prior guest chose authenticity. So you are tasked to try to somehow fit that into our conversation today, okay? Now, you also get a chance to, uh, you choose a word for the next guest to dance with. And it could be a peculiar word that you find funny or that just resonates with you. So what are you laying down for them to pick up? Willingness. Willingness screams at me. So we'll go with that one. Willingness. Okay. Not I, I love one, that but, word because yeah. sometimes it's just, um, I think that could be an easier word to stomach than courage, you know, but I'm thinking there's definitely just being willing to do something says courage to me. So I, I really, really like that word. I agree with that. Same Z's that, I, that sits well. All right, so this gets, we just get down to the interview part of this. Um, I like to explain to people how we met and I, this plays well into synchronicities. So I believe we actually met through the Go For Your Win community. We both had signed up for that. And I don't know if you did, but I had signed up during the $1 intro mm -hmm. <laughs> course. <laughs> And I didn't realize until recently that they actually closed the course and I hadn't finished it. So I know some people were kind of bummed that there wasn't any heads up, you know, hey, we're going to be closing it, but it, it is what it is. And I did, I got a lot out of it and even maybe just as much or maybe even more, if I can say that, what I got out of it was the uh, connections I've made uh, through that community because everyone's doing such crazy great stuff because the whole group is it's about going for what your win looks like not what someone else's win looks like because maybe that's talking in front of crowds of thousands of people and that's not you maybe you have a very more quiet you know behind the scenes type of win and I love that the whole process of this course brought you through what does your win actually look like? We need to start there, envision it, craft it, and then going through the itty gritty of, okay, well, what skills do you actually need to cultivate to get to that point? So I really did like that. And then um, here recently, I took my Akashic Records level two course where I was learning to read for other people. And um, I just put out a call for volunteers on the group page and said, hey, I need volunteers to help me finish my homework because I have to have 40, 40 people to read for. 
and you you messaged me and you're like yeah sure I'll do it and so you signed up and then the weirdest thing happened Stacy okay so I woke up that morning of our of our appointment feeling completely fine and then as it got closer I had the strangest stomach pain come up I was like I just kind of waited for it to dissipate or go away. And I'm like, this just came out of nowhere. I hadn't even eaten anything weird to make my stomach feel that way. And I was wondering to myself if I should cancel, you know, our reading. And I asked my Akashic Records and they said, yes, reschedule. And so I messaged you and I swear, like the moment that you sent me back a message on Facebook Messenger that just confirming that it wasn't a mistake that I had canceled and, and that we could reschedule that moment. Like it went away. It was so crazy. And, um, but I took that opportunity to click on your profile and it said polarity therapy. And I know the universe has a divine timing and everything is so synchronistically orchestrated that, um, I had just released a podcast about polarity and maybe I wouldn't have re done that podcast if I had had, if I had been distracted and had already known about your polarity connection. So it was just, it serves as a signpost. Okay, here I have done this podcast about polarity. This thing didn't come through, but I checked out her profile. I think it was later. I'm not sure exactly when, but, um, and it said polarity. I'm like, oh my gosh, definitely need to do this. Let's get her scheduled for a podcast interview. And I haven't had a guest in a while. In fact, I took maybe a six week hiatus from the podcast altogether because um, as I explained in an episode or two ago that even just thinking about it, like doing a podcast felt repulsive. Like I felt this revulsion to it, but it just wasn't right. It wasn't time. I apparently was doing a lot of inner work or having my winter season. I'm not sure exactly what, but um, I'm slowly getting the inspiration back to and the excitement. Okay. Yeah, I do want to do this um, because I get to meet interesting people and find out what the heck is polarity therapy Stacy <laughs> there's like so much in what you said but I'm really like happy to be here on like your first show back and that's so exciting just to see like someone else feel that inspiration kind of coming back after a while and what was so beautiful about what you said was that you gave yourself what it sounds like some grace like during that period of not forcing things. And I feel like that's where we get stuck sometimes where we try to force things into reality when that might not be what we need to do. And that's that part of, um, you know, that inner work is like listening to yourself and actually like validating what's, what's coming up for you and, and acting upon that and not like acting against it and forcing things that aren't meant to happen right now. And just like listening to yourself. So I feel like that was a really beautiful, thank you for sharing that that like helps me, you know, like, oh yeah, right. Give yourself your, your little grace periods of self-reflection and coming into self and doing your own healing work. Because my experience in working with clients and in my own healing is that you can get so caught up in um, being there for other people and doing your readings and tapping into so many different people's energy, but the healer not giving themselves time to sort of like come back to self and regroup and reground. And I think that's super empowering as a healer is to remember that you also matter <laughs> mm -hmm. and your health and energy is super important to take, to take care of. So that was really beautiful. Um, so to answer your question, so let's just skip in. So polarity, the focus of it is really about as a polarity practitioner is help is assisting someone in building their health and coming back to vitality. And that's really the goal. And, and through that, believing that within our physical body, that we have an energy body, like an electromagnetic energy that's running, you know, and sometimes you feel like it's really low when you don't have a lot of energy and people use that term all the time. You know, like I just don't have a lot of energy today. I'm feeling really wound down. And it could just be like the electromagnetic energy is slow, slow moving. And we need to kind of bring up its vitality. And that could be through movement. It could be through food and nutrition. 
It could be through changing the way you're thinking about something, the way you're, you're looking at it through a certain perspective. Um, body work, maybe you're just holding a lot of tension in the body that needs to be moved out. So through those practices of movement, health building, and working with an individual, and what's so beautiful about polarity is that it's a very like individual experience where we take assessments and we, we talk to someone about what's your lifestyle like, what are you taking in every day, what's your, um, we kind of get into a little bit of history, physical or otherwise, and it's so it's very personal, very personalized to the client coming in. And, and working with them, like, what are some things that's coming up for you? What are you noticing in your life? And for me, when I'm working with a client, my biggest goal is to help educate them. And with it, so that they know how to, like you said, listen to yourself and what you need. Maybe it's a season and not be so dependent on someone else to give them all the answers, right? Like sit within yourself and know what to give yourself, know what you need. Do you need movement today? Do we need to look at your nutrition? Do I need to switch that up? Um, so really polarity therapy is about coming into your own life and just looking at where that, that polarity, the yin, the yang, the push, the pull is happening. So how do we take that and come back to balance, to centeredness, to groundedness within the self? So it's a very individual, it's a very individual experience and session and no two are the same, that's for sure. And some very deep healing can, can come up there. Um, and it's a really beautiful sacred space. You know, when you show up and you're willing and you're open and you want to do that deep healing work, super important to have someone there with you in that container that can, can hold that space for you. So I'm very honored witness to a lot of deep healing that happens within some of my clients. Um, and it's very beautiful just to kind of witness that, you know, that, that divine timing. I talk about that divine space where, where two or more, like where one, one or two are, there I will be. It's like when two people get together in a very open healing space, some, some magic can, can happen. And it's really beautiful to witness. So is this, you know, like a lot of permanent or long lasting changes? It sounds like this is uh, definitely a process. It's not like, it's not sounding like it's a, a two hour meeting and then you're, you're fixed and you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, there can be definitely moments where say you flip a perspective on something and it's like, it's, you look, you're looking at something in a totally different way that moving forward can completely change the trajectory of your life. And that can happen in those like aha moments when you're just talking to someone and working through experience. Um, but yeah, it can be. Uh, and like a healing process, I would not say to someone like, you know, you go to someone and you're healed for life. Like it takes time when you're doing the work and polarity therapy, our goal is to really get to the root cause. And that can take some time. You know, it's like my focus is, is really building a real rapport with clients, taking time, respecting trust and, and them working at their own pace asking them questions to help, you know, bring some stuff up if they're to discover if they're struggling and just being present with them. And sometimes, you know, just being present with someone, they just, they'll, they'll tell you everything when they feel safe and when they feel seen and when they feel heard. And um, it's, you almost just get to, to be there and be a witness and assist them in, in resourcing and, and working through their experience. But yeah, I can definitely, you know, I don't usually tell someone, I feel like that's, I would never, um, try to tell anyone like come for one session and you're good for life. But the goal, like I said, is to educate people. And the basis of polarity therapy is founded on an Ayurvedic principle. So we work with the five elements of nature all the time and it comes up in life. It shows up in the body. And we, we have those five elements of earth, air, fire, water, ether that show up in everything that we do, um, in life. And so I try to educate people on those elements and when they're showing up and are they yin not a lot showing up or are they yang too much maybe you're someone that's really really angry which would be like the fire element that would be in yang or maybe you're someone that doesn't really speak up a lot maybe you're like a little bit mousy so you might be more yin in your fire energy so it's just that working with people on those elements so they can call upon it in themselves of oh I need some more fire energy today and then finding a resource that they've grown with in their life to help implement and bring up more fire energy so they can move on through their day and, and just be more interdependent and independent of themselves. Okay. So what came to mind when you were saying that is, um, 
you know, I listen to an astrologer and she often talks about, you know, the, the elements and then one's chart where there can be a lot of fire or a lot of water or, you know, there can be where like, if you do have a challenging, I don't know, aspect or (laughs) whatever, sometimes the answer is on the opposite side of the astrological wheel on the opposite side of the Zodiac. So if there's something happening here, the answer in air quotes to that is found on the opposite side. Um, But I can see where that's talking more like a, maybe like a default, um, kind of like what you're born with and what you're dealing with is more on a day-to-day basis. Is that- it can be. I mean, I'm a fire sign. I'm a Leo. <laughs> and I feel like I've always had a bit of like a fire um, energy and drive to things. Um, but I do notice when I go into more of a water element and I might be feeling like a little bit heavier or a bit more um, like deeper into my emotions for a little while, and not having as much, you know, motivation and direction in life. So there's a part where I'm like, okay, I need to, I'm, I get to, I get to bring in more fire. <laughs> this is, we've done this enough and it's time to get back into action and get into movement. Um, so I might go out and uh, uh, start a new project, just something or, or have tiny little micro goals to just kind of get that fire energy back on back going. Right. So it can be you know, something that you're born with, depending on your fire sign or your zodiac sign. And we do work with zodiac signs and clarity um, because it helps give us sort of like a, like a foundation or like a fundamental place to start. If someone's coming and they don't really have a lot of things they want to work on, um, they might just need like a balance in their, um, their energy as far as like a water sign or an air sign or fire sign. I would be able to look at that and and just as a practitioner, um, just observe them and where that, that, energy might be out of balance and need, need a balancing session. But um, yeah, some people, it can change really quickly too, you know, through life-changing events, your energy can change pretty fast as well. You know? So do you have, do you find that your clients um, come from a certain background or they're in a certain field? You know, it's through my clinical sessions, I would say um, in my work, we had a lot of clinical hours in our schooling that we had to do. And it was really great seeing people from many different aspects of life who were coming in because some of them were, you know, friends of family or colleagues. So we really got to see um, people from many different areas of life. But I think the the one thing that I really noticed as sort of like a like a consistent, you know, common denominator is someone who has decided that they're ready to take a deeper heal, like deeper healing a little bit more seriously or ready to start facing um, some, some, you know, discomforts within the body, or maybe they're ready to let go of something that's going on or just like ready to, to talk about some experiences or just curious. Um, but most of the time, I feel like a lot of people that I see are just people who are ready to do some deeper healing work. So I feel like that's something that has come up. It's like, people who are ready to do some healing tend to just, they just find clarity. Do you ever find, um, I guess I'm thinking about myself, how I feel like, um, you know, I'm Scorpio rising. And so I feel like I, I really love talking about transformation and delving into some of the deeper aspects. Um, but then sometimes Oh gosh, you know, you have that coming to Jesus moment and you realize what's required of you to actually change. And you're like, I'm not quite there yet. (laughs) Do you have any Uh, clients like that? Well, I mean, I think like I always try to be my best client and like take a lot of my own advice and, and really do the work on my own. And I really think that to me, that's when spirituality sort of transformed for me is that it wasn't about just sitting and meditating. It was like, when you have that moment where courage is being asked of you to show up and, you know, it's time to just give yourself some love and, and, and start creating that life that you want for yourself. And then what does that mean? And those moments come up and actually taking that leap of faith on yourself to me, that's when like spirituality became deeper and truer for me was when it was like, okay, now I'm being called. Like you said to this, I get to have courage to act on this right now. Oh God. (laughs) Like that's, it's like, do I want that? Yeah. And I remember the moment that I had where I realized that for me, 
um, that self-love was like one of the most courageous acts because, you know, when you start wanting to live life a certain way or do certain things for yourself, cause it feels true for you. And then actually acting on it, even though it might be different than how you've been behaving over the last 20 some years of your life. And you know, that things around you will probably change and friendships will maybe fall away. It's like that, that might be, um, a result of what you're going to do, but that the courage to just be there for yourself and hold yourself and nurture yourself and listen to yourself. Like that's, that's some pretty courageous stuff, man. It's pretty beautiful. I would agree. Um, especially when we talk about the uh, friends, um, falling away that, um, I have found that to be true and it's been really challenging and difficult. And, um, my default would be to, you know, when these friendships fall away, like, oh gosh, what did I do wrong? Like what it's wrong with me? Because, you know, I feel like everyone should like me. And then, you know, if you're living in alignment and you're living light and love, you know, who wouldn't want to be in relationship with that? Right. So, you know, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? Um, and I, it has been something of requiring self-reflection as to did I actually do anything wrong or am I actually just finally setting some boundaries and living myself first <laughs> and that's the problem. So I've had to ask myself some, some interesting questions regarding that. Well, I mean, and how often, like when we're growing up, we're not really taught how to, to be okay, or that it's okay if friendships transition out, right? Same with relationships, romantic or otherwise, that that can transition into just friendship, or it can transition into like, you know, this doesn't, this doesn't work anymore. We talked earlier about trying to force, and, and that's that when we talk about energy. So with polarity, and energy work it's you even and you mentioned it earlier today which is a nice little segue so with energy if you try to force two poles together they're going to repel right so if you're trying to force that like that doesn't belong you're just going to get resistance you're going to get resistance and then finally be done and let it go and it'll just fall away right but we're not taught how to listen to those cues and that it's okay to hear those cues of like man this friendship's just not aligned to to where I'm at in my life or where I'm going and that that gets to be okay. And it can be sad because it's like, maybe we have a lot of shared experiences with that person. It doesn't have to mean that it can't, doesn't have to be sad. And like, it's almost grief in a way, right. That you experience. And, and really, I remember for me growing up grief, that conversation around that only really came up around the physical death of the body and someone, you know, in my life passing away, but it never really got brought up in a conversation of, you know, if, friendship no longer being there or a romantic partner no longer being there that was something that I got to learn on my own (laughs) but that's that part right and then that comes in waves and and understanding that process and it's like I feel like when you when you touched on it earlier of like when you maybe the conversation of, of having a podcast was sort of repelling in a way that's just magnetic right so it's like not living in alignment to something at the time and trying to force it it's just gonna push it away but when you're in alignment and you've got these like bright ideas and then the right person comes in it just whoop, just comes right together like no problem yeah we can reschedule we can re- we can align to another day easy takes that energetic charge off it rather than trying to force something and then becoming all wound up about it all charged up about it and then like pulling yourself completely out of alignment rather than just you know finding the flow and coming back to neutrality what it- came to mind when you were talking about um yeah how we're not taught to let things go there is a lot of pressure and all of the indoctrination is about forever you know bff best friends forever and you know you don't get married with the uh you know the concept of there being you know other marriages down the road you think this is going to be it and this is the one, and, um, and, and then, so I had experienced a divorce. I went through a divorce and that was really, really painful. Um, so I think I wasn't explaining to my family the struggles I was going through. I didn't think it was 
their place, right? Because as soon as you tell someone um, in your family how someone's done you wrong, oh my gosh, sometimes you can forgive your partner, your your you're the one that you're in love with, but the other people around you, they don't forget so easily. And so, yeah, I just figured- Where are the pitchforks? Like there's pitchforks everywhere. Yeah, yeah. so I knew, and I had been told, taught this, that growing up, any issues between you and your spouse were between the two of you. And so when I did decide to get a divorce after 13 years, it was kind of a shock to, I think a lot of people and there's a lot, a lot of judgment and there's a lot of judgment on myself. You know, what could I have done better this and that? And <clears throat> so now when, you know, but same at the same time at, at that place, when we would have, whenever we would attend a wedding, you know, at the end, they always say, okay, every, all the couples on the dance floor. Okay. And then they say, everyone who's been married, um, uh, more than, you know, if you've been married less than five years, come off the dance floor, then 10 years and slowly people, you know, (laughs) come off until you have the oldest married couple there on the floor dancing. And in a way that's very beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Um, But at that point, being married for 13 years, we were on that dance floor for a lot longer than a lot of people. And now, so now when someone tells me they've been married for so long, I kind of joke. I'm like, I don't know whether to congratulate you or tell you I'm sorry. (laughs) Because it's like, I really don't know how to go with it because some people have been so indoctrinated that you have, this is the only thing that's allowed and um, acceptable in the eyes of God and your family is for you to stay together. And um, even if you're not happy and you're dying inside and, you know, you just have to suck it up buttercup because you didn't make, you made these vows before, you know, God and family. And so I don't know when someone says, Oh yeah, we've been married for 35 years, whether to say, Oh, congratulations. That's beautiful. Or be like, Oh gosh, I really feel for you because I don't know if they feel stuck or if they're, if they really are still madly in love with their best friend. So it's an interesting dynamic there. Yeah. Such an, like, and that's where you get to uh, just feel out the, the subtle energies from someone, right? Like if someone's sitting in resentment, you're going to feel that like, (laughs) and forcing a marriage together. Like, I mean, it's pretty quick way to, to breed some resentment there. Um, but I, that's it. It's just listening and paying attention to subtle cues, right? It's like you see someone who's really deeply in love that radiates like that's just got an energetic feel. That's like, that's legit. That's the real stuff, you know? And then, um, and it might, like you said earlier, there's seasons. So maybe someone's going through a season too, but, uh, the heart, man, it's a beautiful when, it, when, when I feel like that's that union that people, not you know dream of is when people are in that heart coherence and they're just naturally are in a state of love on a pretty regular basis and then just get to share that with someone else that's so beautiful and I mean you see that when that comes into a room like lights it all up Mm -hmm. so what would you suggest for someone who is not happy they're not in a happy marriage but you as the practitioner are, you kind of get clued in that they need to be happy with themselves and love themselves first. And if that happens, then the relationship might work out. Do you have those situations where you don't think in your wise, (laughs) you know, outside perspective that the marriage is actually the issue that um, the person really just doesn't love themselves and they're not happy with them or Mm -hmm. are there times where you're like okay brother or sister (laughs) yeah you need you know this this marriage is one probably one of the biggest things holding you back what would you what would you say well my the first thing that comes to mind is like it's always so much easier to point a finger at someone else than like actually go internal and do your own work first so um 
I think first it would just be like commendable for someone to even be asking the questions and want to be looking into their marriage. And if it is about them and self-reflecting, but I feel like there's one element um, in nature or in, in polarity that a lot of people um, play down or don't really think of. And for um, us in the polarity world, that's to me anyway, is ether. And for me, ether is all about space and the space in which everything comes together. It's like the container. Um, and I would ask that person if they're giving themselves space to really sit with what it is that they're upset about, what's not working, what's working, what comes up for them, have they communicated it? Um, and in fields of energy in the body, ether shows up here in communication. So are they communicating? Are they asking for what they need? Is that choking itself down? Are they stuffing it in? Um, are they figuring out how to talk to their partner, communicate to their partner? Um, or if they're really just not aligned in core values? And do they even know what their partner's core values are? Do they know what their own core values are? Do they know um, as far as like relationship wise? Um, I, I, I just, I, I try to encourage people to just come back in the body, to sit within the heart, give themselves space to just connect to themselves and their body. And when they ask a question, what shows up for them? And I sometimes will even just do um, a sway test with my clients. So for me, um, when I sway forward, that's a yes. If I go back, that's a no. So I'll sit, like stand really grounded in my body, get really into my heart, settle down, settle in, <sighs> breathe, like stop and just be present with self drop into the body, get out of the head. And then just ask myself the question of like, is this relationship right for me? Or is this what I want? And I'll sway forward or I'll sway back. And it doesn't have to be such a big question, but is it, is there something I'm not communicating? Am I asking for what I need? You know, does my partner know how to love me? Have I even, have I even told them how I feel love or like, you know, the five love languages? Um, so it's like, it, there's moments where you can have these small little conversations with yourself to just get really grounded, really centered, get into the heart and first get to know yourself. Like, what are the things that, that have you feeling love? And does your partner even know what those are? Do you know what your partners are? If it was a relationship, that's how I would go with that. But I, I try to encourage people to get back in their body, take down that energetic charge that they might be feeling if they're in their head, it could be creating a lot of stories. The bodies might be responding in a state of maybe panic or, you know, I have to make this decision now. There's like a rush or there's sadness or there's anger or there's frustration. Get settled, take that charge down, come back to neutral and like sit within the cell because we know the answers. It's just, we're so loud up here in our heads that we don't, we don't hear it. We don't talk to our heart. It's like its own intelligence on its own. Yeah. Um, the just getting quiet with yourself <clears throat> they're just getting quiet with yourself and time I think I'm not alone in this and that there have been periods of time periods of my life where I have felt very uncomfortable with quiet and with um, time because I felt like um, if I had time I needed to be doing something else like you know housework or you know going from my job to home and taking care of kids or dinner or whatever it was, um, I needed to be taking care of someone or something. And um, if, yeah, so if I felt like I was actually having enough quiet or time to have these conversations, then that was not a good thing. Like I was, there was something very wrong with me being able to have yeah, a conversation like that. And I think that's why, sorry, my dog's barking. Maybe, maybe historically it's been um, where I didn't really get a lot. I didn't think from one-on-one -on -one, like talk therapy, but what the value I did see in it is actually carving out that time uh, by paying someone to be in front of you that actually carved out the time where, okay, yeah, I've invested some money and I am here in a different space. I'm not in my bed or at home and I'm in this, uh, something, a completely different atmosphere. That's where I have found um, the value in being able to actually look at things. It's because 
I'm giving myself that time actually. Yeah. And that space conversation too, right? So a lot of people when they're in their own home uh, and for me, I believe your home is an extension of your nervous system. So if everything, you know, if it's a little bit chaotic or you're feeling unsure and the house is disorganized and messy and that's, you come home and you get to see that and the kids are going crazy and the dogs barking. It's just like, yeah, I'm going to sit down right now and give myself, you know, five minute meditation isn't realistic. So taking yourself out of that space, putting yourself in a different container where this is okay to, to exist. Like it's okay here. And it's safe for me here to sit quietly within myself, to have someone ask me some questions that might, might have me discover and transform in some small way, or look at something a little bit differently from a different perspective, you know, an outside party's um, view on something. And you know, that whole, I paid someone else. Cause like, I know then I sit here and I have one-on-one time and I get to talk. Um, one of my uh, teachers that she used to have a client who recurrently came to her, not for body work, not for assistance on her nutrition, but just to have someone to talk to and it not be, um, you know, a conversation about the weather, but it be something about like her soul and her healing and what was coming up for her that week. And she just wanted to talk to someone and it, ha- it be intentional like a very intentional conversation around life and what was coming up for her, because maybe that conversation couldn't happen with the friends that she had or the family that she had, you know, wanting to talk about a marriage that didn't feel right, but no one did talk to to her family about it because of fear of judgment or the opinions and, and having a hard time not getting worked up and, and emotionally triggered or, or feel emotional reaction with the family, but have a space where it can just stay neutral. It can just be a conversation without it meaning too much, but it's just, let's investigate. Let's ask, let's notice how, how does that feel within the body, right? Just a, it's a totally different conversation. Um, and I think we, it's something that a lot of us are kind of growing into now is being, feeling safer and that it's actually okay to, to invest money there, to invest time there into maybe, yeah, it's just a conversation. Maybe, yeah, it's, it's, it's conversation that I don't have to do on my own. And I, it's okay to not have that conversation with my friends or with my family, but I get to take it outside and talk to someone else. Yeah. Because if you are doing it on your own, odds are with some people, including myself, it won't happen. Right. If you're waiting for that, because, um, especially when you have stories in your head or re- regarding money and like a scarcity mindset, it's like, um, I, I don't want to do, I don't want to see a therapist because I could do this on my own. Like I should be strong enough or determined enough to, to just do it on my own, which and doesn't cost anything. But at the same time, I've gotten to the point at points where if I were to, okay, if that is the case, then it may never happen because I look at my track record okay I've had all this time and I've had a lot of motivation to want to change and I haven't up to this point so investing the money where my biggest uh, passion or real like my spiritual urges are like where is my actual where's my heart and investing money there then I can actually like you said carve out that that time and put myself into a different container to actually address some of these things so I know a lot of personal work is done personally on your own time but then also it can also be so helpful to invite in that that other person to you know at least kickstart things for you show Mm -hmm. you what that practice of self-reflection looks like what having, you know, regaining, you know, balance even means or looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And I I honestly, I think the word community is so important too. And it doesn't have to be a community of 1,500, 15,000, 150,000 people. Community can just be, you know, the, the five people on your hand that you can count or like the three people that you have really close to you that, you know, will ask you certain questions or stop you when you're in your head too much and, bring you back into yourself and get you centered again. And, and, you know, it's, it's interesting that um, 
if I do it, I can do it alone. It might take a little longer if I, if I even get there kind of thing, right? It just takes it a little bit longer. Going back to even the go for your wing course, right? Like I believe that I was successful in the completion of that because I did it in a group. And had I done it on my own, I don't know, right? It was that accountability to my team. Um, I'm really grateful for my, the, my buddies that came together and we did it together. I met some amazing people in that course. Oh my God, like earth angels in this course. Like I've met some amazing people and we still connect to this day. Um, and a part of me, you know, I was like really grateful that I chose to say yes to being in this group. Cause I don't know if I would have finished it had I done it on my own. And that is something as a, you know, in my past as a lone wolfer, which I don't really love the labels. I think people go on their own because that's where they feel they can rely on themselves, right? Maybe they weren't able to rely on other people and learning that it's okay to trust yourself that because you know that when you bring awareness to something, you can change it. So, okay, I created a life where I had a life in my past, maybe my childhood where I couldn't rely on this person to have a neutral conversation with me. They were always judgmental. So I just stopped sharing information with my family rather than okay, I'm going to start bringing people into my life. Like I'm taking, it's my life. So I'm going to start bringing people into my life, friends, acquaintances, you know, a coach, a practitioner that I know and trust that I'll be able to have that conversation because that's what I need. So standing in the power of saying, this was my past. This is what I want to bring into my life and going out and getting it. So I want to rely on other people. I want to be able to rely on others, take some of that weight off my shoulders, then you can create that in your life and trust yourself when something goes down, that you've created a really strong foundation and community around you that you can go to for support. Okay, so as soon as you said lone wolf, <clears throat> that brought up something because I have been a part of uh, a, a community, a, a virtual community, but it's been, um, wow, it's been fantastic like you said, calling in and building a community doesn't have to be big and it doesn't have to even be like in your neighborhood. Like these women live all over the world. And I kind of wish that they lived close by so we could hang out on a Saturday night, or whatever, but you know, I'll take what I can get. But um, so G Gabrielle Ginter, she has a My Leap of Faith podcast and she has what's called an energy tribe is what she formed. And there's like 15 of us women. And then we were divided into uh, subgroups by element, but the four element, I think maybe there were five. I know. So anyway, we were divided out in elements um, and I, the pendulum had assigned me to the water group which I thought was beautiful, <laughs> it was perfect <laughs> for me. And um, I have found a sense of community in that group, um, which has been fantastic because like I said, I've had these other friends slowly um, drift, you know, flaking away, uh, going away. So, but one of the assignments or the curriculum in this group was for us to kind of create our own medicine wheel and so we would go to the, you know, in meditation, like a certain direction. So like, say for the direction of the North, you know, what is my spirit animal for the direction of the North? So we can create, kind of create our medicine wheel and create a, sac a sacred prayer. And what came to me was the wolf. And I'm like, okay, well, what does the wolf have to say to me? And the message that the wolf had is that the term lone wolf is which I had taken, I had, had kind of embodied that myself, the lone wolf mentality. You can't depend on anyone else. It's you against the world. And, but what I had gotten, like I said, this past month, I think it was, is that that is a, it's the exception. The lone wolf is the exception. Wolves are community animals. They are a pack, they're pack animals. And so, the message of the wolf for me was get rid of this lone wolf mentality and really accept and open yourself back up to the possibility of community because it's here. You have, you know, a lineage, you have community. And so I thought that was really beautiful. And I couldn't help but mention that when you said the lone wolf. <laughs> Yes. And that community piece too, right? Like I, 
it was interesting because I took COVID lockdown and I feel like I really thrived during COVID lockdown um, because I went into like online courses and I met people from all over and I was tapping into uh, like tea time conversations with women that I was in another group with uh, every week, every Wednesday. Um, so I still kept up that kind of social aspect um, and still learned a lot and still grew within myself and took it as an opportunity to start, you know, doing some more healing work and ended up, I started coaching and working with a lot of women through self-love and um, because that was a huge theme for me um, and finding self-love and what was that like and, and acting upon that. But um, that whole, period of being in lockdown and getting to meet people from all over the world was like, wow, like there's people who are like-minded who are just in a similar place or going through something so big right now, but they have so much to even when they share their story helps create some hope in my life. Like, and they're in India or they're in the UK or that, you know, they're all over the world. It's like, we can find community and we can find connection, which is that huge piece that we talked about that earlier. It's like when you can come, like when you're meant to come together, when you, there's an attraction of energy, nothing can stop you. Whether you're in India, Canada, the U S it's like, you'll come together, however that manifests. And for us during COVID that was, you know, go for your win. That was the, the, the missing piece that brought people together or other courses. And it was zoom, which is like, you know, something that we're using today that helps manifest and create this, this space for the conversation. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people could have, have maybe felt very lonely during, you know, COVID and, and are just lonely before COVID, right? And that community is out there and support is out there. Um, and then coming back to willingness, like, are you willing to start open up and, and trust yourself to bring people into your life that, um, you know, are, are, are okay to be there, that, you know, deserve to be there because your life matters and, and you deserve to be happy and you deserve to feel safe. You deserve to feel sure, content. And so how do we create that in your life? How do you get to bring that into your life? And that can be through those meaningful connections. And sometimes we're just scared to create them, right? But just allowing people to know that it's okay and it's safe to recreate, to rediscover, to transform. And that can happen in the smallest ways. And I, you know, I think transformation, that word, we can look at it like, you know, someone has transformed their lives because they completely quit their job, you know, went out and bought a, uh, an RV and are living in, in the woods or whatever it is like a huge transformation in life. But I think that a transformation can just be a small, like minute change in life that we don't acknowledge. It's like, we don't validate them. Cause it's like, Oh, you know, I started wearing different clothes. It's not a big deal. It's like, well, no, like if you're drawn and attracted to, you know, colors now when you used to just wear black, like that's a transformation or if you're drawn to different music all of a sudden, like that's a transformation. These like small little moments that we get to validate that a lot of times we don't, we don't put a value or like, it's not valuable. It's not a valuable. It's not a big transformation. My bank account didn't go up $50,000. It's like, no, but you started to look at life of like, how can you, create revenue or how can you create like an energy stream of money towards you by doing something that's unique to you the thought of even how can I do that that's a transformation like that's a wake up and we get to validate those and see them as valuable moments in our life like that's transformation all right so let me explain what I thought maybe polarity therapy was <laughs> So when I had gone, um, my first marriage and I had gone to a marriage counselor, I had a, this, I had like this frenzy, how you described it earlier. I had this frenzy of, of mental activity and I was like, oh my gosh, okay, if I do go through with a divorce, then this is going to happen. You know, maybe family members will disown me. There's going to be a lot of shame. And there's the uh, financial piece. There's the, um, I don't, I, uh, what if my spouse, um, you know, what if they can't make it, you know, without me, there was a lot of, um, responsibility still for him that I was feeling. And when I went into that marriage counselor, she asked me, what was the worst thing that could happen? And so here's where I get to the polarity piece. I'm like, 
Okay. The very worst thing that I could see happening is because at that time I was uh, suicidal. I had lost um, my a brother and my whole world had been upside down. And then I, you know, I had my daughter and I was, my husband had mental health issues and it was just a huge struggle. I was like, the worst that can happen is, hold on. The worst that can happen is that uh, my daughter is left without a mom. And she was like, okay, so considering that, uh, pol- you know, that polar opposite, of what, you know, the best is possible and the worst that's possible. This uh, does, does um, divorce seem like the worst thing in the world compared to that, your, your, your daughter losing a parent. And I was like, oh, you know, golly, no, you know, come to find, you know, come to think of it, people do get divorced all the time now. And it's like, A lot of these people who are judging me, they've had divorces themselves. And so it's like, you know what I do need, it it would not be the end of the world if this happened. And so I guess I kind of thought that's what polarity might be. It's like looking at a complete opposite and finding the truth or the balance in the middle, or kind of like, you know, how, uh, kind of like the analogy of a triangle, um, People are so polarized, but if you can get that third perspective, that third yeah, perspective where you can see both sides of that mm-hmm. line, it opens up so much more space. So in a way, you are correct. But so the way that I see that in the story that you, thank you for sharing your story. Um, that's really beautiful. I've, my life has been touched um, by suicide before and it's, it's, um, you know, for people just to know that they're, they're loved unconditionally and that everything's going to be okay. You know, I just, I want people to know that um, they're loved, that they matter. Um, so in your story, when you're go- about to go to the counselor and you're in your head and you're having all these conversations, all I, all I as a practitioner for polarity, see is air element, air element, because you're up in the air, right? All these thoughts, all the story and it's yang, you've got a lot of it. So it's like, I'm up in my head. I'm not in my body. There's no earth. I'm not grounded. So like, how do I get from here and, and the energetic charge that's with that? Cause you feel that in your body, right? Shoulders probably go up tension in the body, holding it all in because of the stories, all the uncertainty. So how do we get from this and up here down back into the body in a relaxed state of being, take the charge off, come back to neutral. And that can be through the question that like your, your therapist asked you or your counselor asked you was, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Help bring you into a like a thought process and how you thought through thought yourself through to something that helped ground you to bring your earth element back in so as a polarity practitioner yes we do that but I look for elements um, and how to bring you back into neutral out of yang or out of yin how do we how do we do that how do we walk through that process together okay gosh let me ask you this because I feel as though um I have probably a lot of water. (laughs) So someone who has a lot of emotions that they feel is very burdensome to to them. And that, uh, how? okay, so how would you as a practitioner with someone who has a lot of water, what would be some of your first tips to balance them? Well, like you kind of said earlier, like there's like the opposite on the other end of it, right? So when I think of someone who might be like yang water, like they've got a lot of water going on or like really emotional right now. And it's like coming out in tears, like, um, and just maybe are really heavy. Like, like there's that burden. Like when I think of the word burden, I just think of heaviness. Like I feel that in my body, my shoulders get heavy and like, I just drop. Right. Um, and my immediate is fire. We got to find some fire and how do we bring fire back into to the equation. So that's where I try, I work with my clients to educate them to know what they need. So, okay, right now I'm noticing and I'm just becoming aware of my water element being yang right now. There's a lot of water going on and it's okay to first just notice it in the body as it's elemental space that's taking up, that's taking up space. I've got a lot of water going on. So what's a way that I can offset that or, or what's the next step for me? And it might be fire. So that might be an action of something. Maybe it's journaling, 
to get the thoughts out. And, and if you're in a lot of water, granted, you'll probably just flow. Like it'll just come out of your pen. And we did this in go for your win. There's like an exercise where it's just expressive, right? For 20 minutes, you're not, you don't have a subject. You don't have anything specific, put a pen to paper and just go and set a timer, give yourself the time and the space to just let that come out. Doesn't matter what you write. Doesn't matter what comes out. Just express and do it for 20 minutes. And that could just be one fire action to help bring that fire energy back, go for a walk, move the muscles, get some movement. That's another fire element that you can bring in there. So I find that it would just be that unless there's someone that's already doing a lot of that, that might not be the case, but that's where you get to know your clients and you ask those questions. But uh, that's where I would probably start would be to find that and why I believe, like I will always be learning and I will, you know, be bringing in more resources into my soul and into myself so that, that when something does happen or if I'm feeling like that, I can call upon my resources. What do I have within me to get me through this moment? Or what do I need to, what do I have within me that I can call upon in this time? So right before our conversation, you sent me a picture, a diagram of electromagnetic field around a human being. And I have, uh, you know, I've of course heard about the human magnetic field before electromagnetic field. And I have personally loved that concept um, or that, that knowledge because I have come from a background where feelings aren't real. You know, your thoughts aren't real. Your, the only thing that's real is what you can see around you, what you can taste and touch and those are real, but everything else is not real and you're making it up or it needs to somehow change to fit what is around you. I don't know if I'm expressing that very clearly, but I'm with you. I, I love how um, even just thoughts, um, they can generate, right? They can add a certain charge and these are measurable, right? I mean, and when you eat a certain way, you, it can change your, uh, your charges. And like, there are things that people have said don't really matter um, that totally, totally do. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like invalidating somebody's life experience to make like, just makes us shut down to like close ourselves up, right? And who are we to invalidate someone's reality? The way that I see life could be completely different the way that you see life based off your life experiences, right? If you've been someone, like you said, thank you for sharing, who's been like close to suicide, you might look at someone and, and notice signs in them, like a flag that you might be able to intervene and do something or someone else who's looking at them who has not had a li their life touched by suicide or mental health would see nothing and continue to walk by like it's no big deal, but they looked at the same person. You just picked up on different cues. We look at life through our own perception based off of our life experience and our memories, what's in our subconscious. And the, the photo that I sent you of those electrical currents and, and polarity, we work on those. We do movements that help with the free flow of that energy and get it moving. It's like, um, like a hose. So if you have a hose outside that's kinked, you're getting no water out of that, right? You're like, where's the kink? Where's the kink? And as soon as you open the kink, you get water right? You open up the flow. And it's like, that's what happens when we, we start opening up our energy flow by having those conversations and releasing those tensions in the body and allowing those, you know, experiences in life to be valid. And finally releasing that through the body. So it's like that mo oh, I just got to chill. So it's like that moment that you say something to someone and they invalidate it. All of that emotion, all of that experience then gets balled up <laughs> like in our energy form. It doesn't go anywhere because we haven't resourced it out. We haven't let it flow through the body. We haven't emotionally regulated anything. It just gets stuck. And it'll get stuck in those energetic cir circuits of energy until it gets activated again through some trigger or some event that reminds you of it. It comes right back up and you feel it almost like in your stomach. You know, if you drive past a restaurant where you, your ex broke up with you or something, or, you know, where you got in a fight with a friend and every time you see them, you can feel it in your gut. It's like, because we haven't emotionally resourced it out. We've like pushed it back in. 
And so it's like, as we start to move through those experiences and why healing takes time is because there are so many layers to that. And you look back on yourself when you started a healing journey and you become very, you, you start to become more aware to your life experiences and you start asking yourself more questions and you move through those experiences and you look back at yourself five years ago and you're a completely different person because you forget how far you've come because you might still be replaying the same story or an old pattern that got stuck when someone invalidated your life back when you were 10, 12, you know, it's just finally getting a chance to come up. And because you built the resources up within yourself, you can finally resource that out on your own, which is a really beautiful thing. Right. Because like you mentioned, healing takes time, but it doesn't take only time because there have been things that, you know, if I don't deal with, you know, oh, it just, it's, this is going to take time. Well, shoot, you know, 10 years later, I'm still feeling. So yeah, it takes time, but it takes time. (laughs) And like you said, acknowledgement and, um, and getting those tools. Yeah. Well, and why I think what drew me into polarity therapy as a student way back in, I think it was like 2016 when I came into my, uh, my life, um, was the idea of getting to the root cause of something. And for a lot of people that can be really scary because I think we know what it is. <laughs> um, and it's easier just to like, I don't wanna deal with that. I don't wanna go there, but that could be a root of something. Um, so, you know, I, I really, I believe that it takes some time to like build up your courage each time to go a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and assisting others along the way and bringing them with you and, and finding that community and, and reaching out and asking for help on- the days that you need it and you know finding the right practitioner because you might find a counselor and they just don't work for you you know what they say doesn't land it's not quite working and then finding you know go finding another one but it is when you have those resources you can move into those actions just to assist you to get through it a little bit quicker meditation practices that you can just like drop right in a meditative state a little bit quicker because you've been practicing for a while and when you're in meditation state that that's neutrality when you're in a meditative state there is no energetic charge you're not pulled one way or pulled another. You give yourself the gift of neutrality, centeredness, groundedness, sovereignty is there where you can trust yourself to make the choice. You're not pulled in one way or get the clarity. It'll just drop right in. Do you have any um, like testimonials that or case studies that you could tell us about just to exemplify like what, the kind of healing that's possible because mm-hmm. you know you were talking about earlier about how something this can be worked through I'm like oh you mean that's possible <laughs> I'm <laughs> um, really being facetious but at the same time right some people are like yeah. you know is it even possible to pass that place where your ex broke up with you or yeah. something happened where there's not that charge <laughs> anymore like is that even that's possible <laughs> yeah so uh just uh, for confidentiality for clients, like I have a, my personal experience, it's just easier to speak for myself and, and how it was for me. Um, but I, I was raised by a single mom, my parents divorced when I was quite young, seeing my dad happen very, you know, sporadically, it wasn't like a super consistent experience. Um, and I had been in a relationship from probably uh I moved to Niagara Falls in 2012, just a little bit before that. We were together for about eight years and I thought it was it. Like all I could see was like, this is him, him and me forever, put so much into it, like invested so much of myself. And that's the, that was the kicker was I invested so much of myself into him as the vision, but I didn't put me in the center of that. It was just him, 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 right? Um, And when we started hitting more of like a rocky space, like I got so scared to leave that, eventually found the courage and and got out of that relationship to to choose myself and that it was okay. But I was then 30, I was like 30 years old. I'd spent my twenties in this relationship, never really dated, didn't go out on dates, didn't know what that was like. Um, So scared that I was too old now, (laughs) you know, like what all the stories you can make up. So I remember going on a date. I thought it went really well and then never heard from him again. And I remember being so upset about it. Like he ghosted and I was like, so sad. I'm like, what is happening? I remember crying. I didn't want to go anywhere. Just like dating sucks. Like, oh, this is ridiculous. 
this is so hard. Did I make a mistake? Like all up here, right? Feeling very emotionally um, just drained, like exhausted. And so I'm like, I'm going to meditate today. And I'm not leaving my mat till I figure this out, like what this is, what's going on. Because like at the bottom of it, I knew it wasn't just, I wasn't this upset about some guy I didn't know not calling me back, right? Like it's just some guy I don't even know. Like, why am I so worked up about it? Like, I'm not, I'm not leaving this mat until I figure it out. And I remember just feeling, I'm like, what is this emotion? Like, what is it that I'm feeling? Like, name it, name it, name it. And I just sat there and I just sat there. And eventually I got to abandonment. And I realized what had been triggered in that experience of what I thought was a really beautiful connection that is now all of a sudden gone had triggered abandonment within me. And I'm like, oh, yeah, because that runs through me. Like abandonment had been running through my body and has shown up in my life. And I got to see that now as like an older woman with life experiences who's felt abandoned by her family, who's felt abandoned by a partner that she was in a relationship with every day for eight years abandoned by other people who said they'd be there for her and weren't and like that's what I was feeling and I got to sit there and I remember starting to come down and like breathing and feeling the space in my chest and just started to like breathe again I remember saying to myself like God has not abandoned me and no one has abandoned me my family loves me my father loves me and as long as I don't abandon myself there is no abandonment like never been in yourself and, and you're good. And I remember like bringing myself down and it took away the charge and it was like, I was able to move forward, but I had to give myself that time of sitting in the uncomfortability of abandonment until I could figure out that that's what I was actually feeling. See it, that it happened in my life, allowing it to happen in my life that like I, I validated it and was able to move it through my system that emotion of abandonment that got stuck in my energy field had just been triggered and I was able to release it, I resourced it out. And you can talk about chakras and you can bring that in and that it got triggered, came out of my heart chakra. I opened it up, my chest expanded <sighs> and was able to move forward and know that I was going to be okay. It was just one date, just some guy, but awesome. Cause I just went next level into my, myself. And we talked earlier about the word to bring in that's authenticity is like the truer you get with yourself and the deeper that you get with yourself and you get to know yourself. And the real part of you gets to come out more and more and more every day beneath the stories, beneath the trauma, beneath the stuck emotions. That's, that's for me, that true authenticity is like underneath that. I was before that got triggered, I was like a little girl or a young woman who was feeling really abandoned and alone. And I got to sit with myself through that and nurture myself through that and be self-compassionate and self-loving. And that didn't come from anyone else. That just came from me. You mentioned earlier that part of your practice as um, a practitioner is to address the foods that someone eats. And so what came up for me is I wonder if I were to sit with my resistance to healthy food changes where that would be have come from and and why <laughs> do you have a, a lot of people who are willing to make other changes but when it comes to their food they're not well yeah I mean like food survival right like we've just become so accustomed to that and just creating like habits over life or you know other people fed us and we just ate it until we became like conscious to oh I get to choose what I want to put in my body but god chips are awesome like I just want chips right now or like Oreo cookies are my favorite um but it's I, you know I have my own personal experience with food that's something that I'm I'm I get to heal and I'm working on right now um but I think for some people you know we aren't taught growing up in life that we're not to are we meant to eat for egoic desires or are we meant to eat for vitality and nourishment like what is the point of food is it to nourish is it to enrich our bodies? Is it to give us energy? No. Is it to it's lighten not. us up? Yeah. It's, it's so, not. <laughs> that's not how we're taught. It's it's very, feel ego good. <laughs> very egoic ways of, of, of eating, right? So, yeah. um, and it's distorted. So we get to, we get to reintroduce things into our body. We get to try new things. Um, for someone I would say who is more of like a heavier earthy person, they might want more air foods, which would be like 
things that grow up on trees or things that grow in the air or someone who's very airy and up in the air might need a grounding food. Maybe they need a little bit of meat to help bring them back or root, root vegetables, things that grow on the ground. Yeah, what's coming to mind is um, I have I follow Courtney Starkey um, on her YouTube channel. And one of the things that she does, she relates a lot to the celestial realm, to the ether. And that's even how when she grounds in air quotes or at least gets centered, she's kind of doing so an upward uh, to the sky way. She does not relate to grounding downwards. However, when it comes to her food, she thinks that that's a way that she grounds because she likes this special kind of tea that tastes like dirt, she said, but she likes it. <laughs> and she's like, she's like, I think that's how I get that element in because um, I get it through my, my tea that tastes like dirt. <laughs> She and there it. really is no one size fits all, right? Like yeah. I think it's, it is different for everybody. And some people love to garden because they feel closer to their food and it, it helps give them like, more, like, yeah, like a better relationship or a closer connection to what they're putting in their body. Um, they know where it came from. They know how it's treated. Um, you know, I do think like small little changes to diet. And a lot of people aren't even like my biggest surprise is how um, unaware people are of their eating habits. Like they're not really sure or like eating on the fly, just kind of eating whatever, but not eating with an intention. So if your intention is you want vitality, eating a lot of really high processed foods, um, really greasy, like fatty foods might not give you vitality, right? It doesn't even feel mm -hmm. like something that would give you vitality. So I think it depends on like your goal of food. Um, and are you putting restrictions on yourself or are you just allowing yourself to experience life? And like once in a while, just grab me because it's okay. And you're at a party and you're having a piece of cake and you're neutral, right? It doesn't have all of that meaning on it. And that's where I get to have my transformation is, um, you know, getting to have certain foods, not like I can't have it because, you know, I've gained COVID weight or whatever. It's like, no, you, a lot of people have gained COVID weight. It's, it has happened and you get to have the experiences still. We don't have to restrict ourselves from things. It's not, and I, and it was interesting because I caught myself in that dialogue and I hadn't realized until I started to look at that aspect of my life, how deep diet culture, I had been affected by diet culture, how deep I had been affected by societal standards of beauty and what that means and my value that I put on myself around my body or around my weight or beauty standard, like how twisted it had been. And, and that's where I say like, it, it, it takes time and it can take self-forgiveness because all those extra layers come up and those conversations when they happen, instead of going into self beat up and restriction and self-judgment, it's like, wow, like this is, this is deep. Like this is a deep run program that I get to unlearn and I get to, to reevaluate and I get to change. And that helps take the charge off things too. Cause when you go into that, that almost like triggered state and you have those conversations, you're like, oh, I can't, you feel the shutdown, you feel the tension. It's like oh, allowance, acceptance, like surrender helps remove that charge off the body, gives the electromagnetic energy back some flow, <sighs> settle down, right? And then move along with the healing. All right, I know I wanna be respectful of your time. And so I, I wanna start to wrap up. I know we didn't really address self-love directly. I had thought maybe that would be where this conversation would go, but I think it really is a self-love. We're just not um, saying it, calling it by that name very often during this conversation. But I think at its core, it really is self-love, uh, learning to validate your experiences, sit with it and um, name it and work it out and figure out um, what you want, what you want from life. What is, what actually is your goal and your motivation for doing things? So I do want to mention that I will be including in the show notes for our listeners, the link to the free ebook self-love because there, I read through it and there is some really great information. Oh. So even though we haven't, our conversation has <laughs> centered on it or focused on the topic of self-love, um, I think it's definitely been woven throughout the conversation and mm -hmm. you definitely listeners, you have access to the free ebook in the link. And, um, as she mentions in the ebook, this is, a uh, her little work of love and, yeah. um, 
you can definitely tell that she's speaking from the heart, from a place of experience. And um, so thank you, Stacey, for that. Thank you. It was a beautiful, um, one of the, a beautiful way to kind of celebrate, like having that moment to come back into myself. And I remember when someone said, I think you just need to like, love yourself. I'm like, what does, what the fuck does that even mean? Like, I don't even know what that means. Um, and so I thought oh, I would have loved like a little guidebook that would have like helped explain to me, like, what is self-love? What does that even mean? And I'm like, oh, I'll just write one. <laughs> and then worked with like a friend of mine was like, oh, edit it. And it just came together so quickly. Um, so it was like a really beautiful, like inspired action uh, moment that I hope you, that you guys, you know, enjoy it and get a lot out of it. Yeah. Some of the best things in life are things that people have written because they would have liked to have had it. So like the Akashic record teachers, they wrote the manual that they wish that they had had when they were learning. So I definitely get what you're saying there. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of, uh, and, and I, I always try like if for people who really know me, it's like, I have so many like books around me and like, I, like I was a seeker for a very long time and I just wanted all the knowledge and I just tried sucking it all up. It's like eventually, you know, putting into practice what landed with you. And yeah, and that's the kicker. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes and, we're so much more comfortable in the student <laughs> role. Like we have all of this in our head and eventually we have that little push. Okay. Well, you, you have plenty of foundation here. You actually need to put it into practice. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this leads well into um, our social presence segments. How can people find out more about you, Stacy? and follow what you're making in your own sandbox. <laughs> okay, so I am on Instagram uh, at the Stacy Kenny. Uh, and I just kind of I, I share content when I'm inspired to. So anytime I have like an inspiring moment, or, um, you know, something in meditation that comes out, that's where I'll, I like to share it and write there. Um, so I've been kind of, I think, dabbling more in, in the writer's sandbox over the last little while. Um, so I tend to, to leave some content there. And uh, also the Seeds of Love podcast on Spotify as well. And I'm on Facebook and you can look me up anytime. I love how in the Lifestylist podcast, Luke's story ends his pods asking his guests this question. So I'm including it in mine. Who have been three teachers or teachings in your life that you might share with our audience that they could go research and also learn from? Oh, well, it's like, I have so many. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to, to leave any of them out, but I will limit myself to three and I will be a uh, laser. Um, definitely Dr. Randolph Stone. He is the founder of Polarity Therapy. Um, and what I love about this man is that he was focused in medical, um, the medical field as a doctor for so long and was open minded enough to travel the world and learn different modalities of how to actually get to the health and the vitality and the soul of a human and how to educate and encourage us and leave behind his teachings to empower us to take our own health into our own hands. Um, and so I believe like Dr. Randolph Stone, if you can find his health building books on, on Amazon or, uh, you know, any even reading through his manuals, but his teachings really um, inspired me because he was so open to Eastern culture and Western culture. And I always find that so interesting. It's like the yin and the yang, you know, and how he came together and created a really integrated unit of health, um, health building for people. Um, and it has been very healing for me. I've gotten to meet some amazing people in the world who are doing wonderful healing work um, through polarity. And it has very much changed my life and how I look at life, um, my life and how I see other people when I meet them. Um, as far as just being aware of myself and other people, that brings me into my second teacher who would oh, be- Let me my... interrupt you just for a okay. quick moment. Was, <laughs> when you mentioned him, it brought to mind probably when I go through later and create the show notes, I'll find a link. And sometimes like for founders, there are directories of you know people, practitioners that you can find in your area who practice whatever it is that they're doing. So- I would imagine I would go to his website and find a directory of people that uh, like a database that um, listeners could go and search for mm -hmm. a um, 
yeah, polarity therapist in their area if they did want in person um, mm -hmm. sessions. Um, but that so made me think about you. Do you have a website where people can book directly with you? Uh, so you can reach me through the Canadian Polarity Therapy Association website. I'm uh, a secretary on the board of that uh, director. Um, so they can find me there, but I don't have my actual website up yet. It's not ready, um, but they can co contact me through there or even just my Insta. But you okay. do have, there's online, there is the digital Dr. Stone database, like what you were talking about. There's the American Polarity Therapy Association where people can find uh, practitioners in their area if they're in the States and the Canadian Polarity Therapy Association if they're in Canada. And I know that there's the International Polarity Education Alliance that I'm a part of as well, which is more of your European. All right, I'm sorry to have interrupted. Go on with your number two. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, thanks for interrupting. I'll, I'll just go. <laughs> like, I'll just keep on going. Um, so number two was Michael Singer. So Michael Singer wrote The Untethered Soul. Uh, and the surrender experiment. But I remember when I was reading The Untethered Soul and he talks so much about observing yourself first. You know, we get so caught up in like judging other people and looking at other people and we're not even really taking time to just sit with ourselves and getting to know ourselves and being curious and noticing how what's showing up for us, for our human side and what's going on within us. And even with another person, when you meet them can be very, you know, he talks about how we walk around with these little thorns in our body and, you know, if someone gets too close to touching a thorn, it's like, we'll shut right down, right? And we push people away or we get really defensive and everybody is walking around with these thorns in their sides or in their arms. And we just get to be compassionate with each other, observe, be curious um, and, and be an observer of yourself. And he really helped drive home um, the power of awareness and becoming aware. That is so be interesting because like you said, we don't, we don't drop in because <clears throat> I'm thinking of, my childhood and when you are in a very unstable environment where um, it's not really safe to be yourself, <laughs> um, you learn to be on alert for what everyone else could possibly be feeling or thinking or what might trigger them and that kind of thing. And so the focus is definitely not on, well, what am I actually feeling? No, it's all based on if I don't do this, this might trigger that and that will trigger this. And then like, everything's going to go to hell. And <laughs> but I love that pointing you back to yourself as a human being, like I'm having a human experience myself. What is it that I'm feeling and observing? So I like that. And you're mm. not the first person to have recommended that book. I seriously mm. need to put that on my, my read list, <laughs> my, yeah. my list to read. I mean, that's like, and I remember taking myself through that book and was very um, present with it. Like when I sat with it, I was with that book. Like I was studying, I was a student. It was something that I made sure that I put like time aside for so that I could actually focus on it. And it wasn't like another book that I'm like, oh, flip through the book, like back on the bookshelf. Like, no, this was something that was like this. There's teachings here. Like this book has a lot to teach you if you will just sit and take it in. Um, and, and I probably could pick it up today and it would be a totally different book for me. Right. Like it land with me in a totally different way, but brings up so much about energy and how it replays into the body. And when it comes back up, if we don't express it, which sat with my polarity work and Dr. Stone and chakras and energy, like they married really, really well together. Um, and I just felt like, like that for me, seeing other people with thorns allows more space for empathy and compassion. And I, I believe right now we are short in, in supply of empathy for each other. Um, and can be a really great way to help bring more light and love to the world is through empathy. And maybe that's the root <laughs> is more empathy for yourself, more empathy for others. Yeah. And I had interrupted again. Sorry. <laughs> so number three. <laughs> okay. It was interesting. Cause I think like at first I went uh, Esther Perel, she's great, but uh, Gary Chapman. So Gary Chapman wrote the five love languages. Five love languages. Yep. I love that book too. And I think I, I just got a thing about fives, like five elements, five love languages. Like if it don't fit on my hands, there's too much information. Like I need to be able to call upon it. Cause I'll oh, say, that's oh, a neat way of is it thinking. love? <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, it's okay. Is it gifts? And I can do my sway. Is it 
is it physical touch and I can do my sway. Like it just helps me navigate things really quickly. Um, because I think, you know, we're, when you become more curious and again with Michael Singer and the awareness and, and, and getting, when you meet someone and you want to show them love, not making it about you. When you meet someone and you want to give them love, get curious about how they actually receive it because you might be trying. And that was something that I didn't understand. And and like a lot of my past relationships, because I would try to show love because I'm an acts of service person. That's my love language. So I would try to show love in actions. But if that person wants physical touch and just wants quality time, I might be doing more action stuff and be like, they don't get it. Like I'm trying to love them. And you know, it's just like, it's going nowhere. It's like, cause I'm not speaking their language, man. Like and just those small little moments of speaking someone's language, whether it's a child, maybe you're giving them gifts a lot, but they really wanted your time. Speak a different language, get curious. What is their love language? So I encourage everyone to get that book. And there's so many now that are love languages for teens, love languages for couples, love languages for kids. Get to know what your love language is so you can actually communicate that to someone. Because maybe you're in that relationship and getting feeling shut down all the time because you're not actually communicating how you feel love. And how do you, how do you speak your love language to yourself? First and foremost, I think that's why I always come back to self-love and why it's so important is because if we're not loving on ourselves and giving ourselves the things that we need, really hard for us to ask or ask for it in other people or expect them to just know, right? We get to take up space in this world and we get to ask for the things that we need and we want. And I love the number five. We'll just go back to that real quick, just be, because in numerology, it is the number of adventure. And I am such a person, I love the idea of adventure. So if I say I'm at the grocery store and there are different aisles open, <laughs> I'll find myself going to aisle five just because of how it, what it symbolizes. It symbolizes adventure balance. It's the, it's the number of balance. And so, yeah, that has been a goal of mine is to find balance in life mm. and the fun, the fun and balance in life. And so that's what I've, I really love the number five for that mm. reason. So I love that so much. That's how I find like the adventure piece. That's how I have, um, I build love with my nieces. I have three beautiful nieces and a beautiful nephew. Um, and I get to spend like that quality time and they'll ask, are we going on an adventure? <laughs> and it's like, I, yeah, let, let's go. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I love, love it. Well, Stacy, was there anything final that you wanted to say before we uh, jump off our call? I think if I could leave listeners with anything, it's that, uh, really just at the end of the day, if there's one thing that they take away and one thing that they get to remind themselves with, or I hope that they remind themselves with, whether you write it down on the mirror in the bathroom or you put it up, you know, on the fridge to see it every day is that you matter, that you are enough and that you are worthy and deserving of a beautiful life. However, you create that for yourself. Love always. Thank you, Stacy, so much for joining me in Sheffy's Sandbox. Much love. Much love. Thank you. <laughs>